we're back again at the physics video lecture physics 203 video lecture 13 <clears throat> and we're starting a new topic I'm going to do a little bit of review but what we want to get into now is Hamiltonian mechanics and that's going to be a long formal development that's um, going to take us all the way into quantum mechanics at the very end of the semester so that should be interesting. But, so, let's go ahead and review briefly what we have with Lagrangian mechanics, formally. We have this object that we call the Lagrangian coordinates velocities and time okay. <clears throat> and the motion of the system takes place in what's called configuration space so the trajectory of the system is in the configuration space I'm not sure if I introduced that before but that's really the space spanned by these cubes. Okay. Um, so the motion takes place in configuration space, and we have n second order differential equations. n second order differential equations. And those are the Euler-Lagrange equations. And just to make sure we're clear on the configuration space, if you're in three space, point particle in three space, then your configuration space is just the Cartesian three space. Okay. But uh, so I'll just go ahead and put these examples. You've got your x, y, z. You've got your spherical polar coordinates. Your r theta b those span space and in general all these n dimensions there <clears throat> and solving these differential equations with uh, initial conditions q of t equals zero q dot of t equals zero you know, you have two n you have n second order differential equations, so you have two n initial conditions. Two n initial conditions. So we're going to go from there to Hamiltonian mechanics. So this is Lagrangian. We go to Hamiltonian mechanics. And I'll just give a really brief characterization in comparison to what we have up there. So Hamiltonian mechanics we're going to have a Hamiltonian that's a function of the coordinates. These would be the same coordinates we have in our Lagrangian formalism and the momenta. So notice instead of velocities we'll have these momenta as defined in, as generalized uh, momenta up here. But there are going to be two n variables. So instead of n second order differential equations, we're going to end up with two n first order differential equations. So you win something, you lose something, right? You have twice as many differential equations, but they're only first order. Two n <coughs> So, okay, so 2n, I should point out, independent dynamical variables. <clears throat> and with regards to these two points up here, the motion takes place in what's called phase space. So motion in phase space, which we'll have to discuss. But phase space is a 2n dimensional space. 
And as I just said, we're going to have two and first order differential equations. <clears throat> and the Hamiltonian mechanics follows from the Lagrangian mechanics. So in order to build up this mechanics, we have to start with Lagrangian mechanics. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we want to obtain this object right here. So first, recall our expression for the energy. E was the sum of dl dq i dot times q i dot minus l. And I'm talking about that Lagrangian up there. We have that as the energy, but we know that this is our canonical momentum. I haven't gotten there yet. This is our generalized momentum. So we can call this P sub i. And of course we have this relation D L D Q I dot minus D L i equals zero, the euler lagrange equations. So what we can look at this as is P sub i dot okay, equals dl dq sub i. Okay, we're going to make use of that. Okay, so this is the energy, it's the quantity that's conserved um, under homogeneity of time. And we're going to introduce the Hamiltonian as this object here. So this, the Hamiltonian, is the Legendre transformation of the Lagrangian. Legendre. to do we need, we need to transform this thing or, and um, express it purely in terms of Q and P H in terms of Q P and P so what we do take the total differential of this expression here and the total differential of the one that we want to obtain and match terms. So the total differential of star, we'll call it, star here. I'm sure that's star here. We have dH equals sum of dPi qi dot plus pi dqi dot. That's under the sum there. And now since we have the Lagrangian, we have minus 
the sum of V L D Q I D Q I minus the sum of V L Q I dot Q I dot and then outside of the summation we have V L D T D T. So that's a total differential. And first we have to work on this a bit because we have P I D Q I dot and these D L D Q I dots are also P I. Okay, so that's P I here, I'll use red. So this is P I D Q I dot. By the way, this is under the sum. Maybe I'll give them all their own sum. And then this one, we can strike against this one because this is, of course, we'll just state it up there, PI. Yeah. See, when I wrote this down, PI was the expression in parentheses, and PI dot referred to the complete Hunt group. Okay. Yeah, so we have that. Um, and that should actually do the trick. Let's simplify here. So pH is equal to sum over, I'm going to change the order here, QI dot DPI minus sum over. Now DL to QI is PI dot, so I have PI dot. QI minus DLDT DT outside of the sum there. So this is I, I, and uh, again, this DLDQI is PI dot right there. PI dot. So good, we have total differential. And now we're going to construct the total differential for our Hamiltonian of this form. Okay. So we're just going to take the total differential of this one here, which is where we want to arrive at. We want to have H, uh, Q, and T. something about the Lagrange transform in a moment. So dH will also dH where H is a function of Q, T, and T is going to be equal to sum over dH dQ sub i dQ sub i plus sum over plus partial h with respect to time, dt, outside of the sum again. And we have the comparison now between these two expressions. So our dp sub i is here, mean that for these two expressions to be the same, this one came out of Lagrangian mechanics, right? For these two expressions to be equivalent, we have to sit, let q sub i dot equal dh dp sub i. Here, I'll box this one in. So what do we find? q sub i dot is going to be equal to dh dp sub i. And likewise, we're going to have a piece of I dot, so it has a minus sign. 
it'll be dH dQ sub i because of the coefficients of the dQs. partial is equal to dHdt. And dHdt is equal to minus dLdt. So what we've arrived at here is the differential equations for the mechanical system when you express um, the energy of the Hamiltonian in terms of coordinates and momenta. So yeah, let me say a, a note about this Legendre transformation. This is something that you can study in its own right. So we go from, so we transform from L equals L of coordinates velocities. Okay, so we have these two n quantities, oops, we get a dot. Two n quantities from coordinates and velocities to H and Q, P and P. Okay. So it's really a way to affect a change of coordinates And if you do that, these are the differential equations that now have to be satisfied. And as you see, there are two n of them because i runs from 1 to n on both of these. Okay, so what's the advantage of this? That's going to unfold as we go through with this. Um, the first thing I'm going to do before I do anything, like before I develop any more formalism, I'm going to do a really simple one-dimensional example to make sure everything makes sense. Okay. Um, and uh, some terminology here. Here's, these are referred to as the canonical equations. They just have the final authoritative form. And it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a symmetric form here. You've got a minus sign. We'll even see what, how to memorize, remember which, which one gets the minus sign. Okay. So no problem here. The canonical equations or Hamilton's equations. example is just a system with one degree of freedom. One degree of freedom. And we'll start with our Lagrangian. In fact, to <coughs> yeah, let's go let's go with our very general system with one degree of freedom. Remember we had we could have a half m x dot squared minus u of x. And one that's a little less simple, we could have L equals one half a of q q dot squared minus u of q. And we, we had seen examples of both of these, okay? And how this one's a little bit more general. Um, let's work with this one first, and you guys can do this one on your own. 
So we want to construct the Hamiltonian. Construct h equals h of q and p. There isn't going to be any explicit time dependence. So the first thing we have to do is write h equals d l d q dot q dot minus l. <coughs> and in this case, that is a of q q dot squared from here, the l q dot q dot. Now if I subtract off l, it's just minus one half a of q q dot squared plus u of q. And of course we get the kinetic plus potential expression that will generically be the case here. Equals t plus u. Um, go ahead and write that out. One half a of q q dot squared plus u of q. Now, is this the Hamiltonian yet? And the answer is no. I'm using the letter H. You know, strictly speaking, I could still use E or something. I'm use the letter H. Not yet the Hamiltonian because it's a function of Q and Q dot. We want it to be a function of Q and P. So note here, H is not explicitly a function of Q and P, which means we're not done yet. We're not done yet. I've got room over here, so we'll go ahead and make this part of the board. So what we have to do is make the substitution. But we have P is equal to DL DQ dot is equal to A of Q Q dot. So we can substitute Q dot equals P divided by A of Q. We can substitute that in here. Now we find, we'll make this substitution, that's the important point. Now we find H equals 1 over 2 A of Q, right? When I put the Q dot in there and square it, I'm going to have A of Q squared the denominator, cancel that one, and I'll have P squared. So let's go ahead and write p squared over 2a of q plus u of q. So now there's the Hamiltonian. You have to just solve for your q dots in terms of the p's and q's in order to make this substitution. So this is now h equals p squared over 2a plus u of q. I'm going to go ahead and put in the, the one in terms of x now, since we went through, through these steps. Go ahead and leave these equations up here for the moment. So yeah, we should have numbered these L1 and L2, doesn't matter. So all right, we also find comma from L equals a half mx dot squared minus u of x h equals p squared over two m plus u of x. A of Q could have just been M. So this is a little more general, but we find this. Now let's go ahead and take the canonical equations. So now we have Q dot and P dot, so I'm going to use X dot for my Q is equal to DH DP, and that would be equal to P 
e over m. I'm just taking the derivative right there, p over m. Two cancel. And of course, that's equivalent to p equals mx dot. Okay. Mass times velocity. So we're good there. What about p dot is equal to minus dh eq. And uh, our q is x, so I'll go ahead and write x here, minus dh dx, and that's minus du dx, minus du dx. Well, this is just Newton's law. Right? The time derivative of the momentum, that is the force, and that equals minus the gradient of the potential energy, or minus the derivative of it. Okay, so that's just Newton's law. And by the way, this allows you to remember which one of these gets the minus sign. The one that gets the minus sign is the one that would have minus the gradient. Okay. So that's a good way to remember that. So this is just uh, mass times acceleration equals. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let's do that last step. Got room right here. So the p dot is m x second derivative, and this equals minus gradient, so that's f, and there we go. Okay. So this should all make complete sense as far as this example goes. Of course, you, you could ask why do we go through the whole rigmarole, because we're back where we started, but uh, that will unfold, why this the usefulness of this formalism is huge, but uh, right now we're just seeing that it's consistent with what we, we've, uh, what we know. Okay, good. So now referring to these equations, I could go ahead and uh, do a little more general type of stuff. Now that we're convinced, we see what's going on, okay, we transform to um, a new set of coordinates, so to speak, Q and P, but when we go ahead with formalism, we see it's just Newton's law after all. Next thing we're going to do is take the complete time derivative. Next, calculate dh dt. Okay. We'll use everything we have up there. So dh dt using the top expression is going to be sum over dh qi qi dot plus sum over dh dpi this is just a chain rule pi dot plus partial h with respect to t outside of the sum now we'll plug in what we know about these so we have dh qi, but our qi dot is dh dpi up there, dh dpi, and we have a sum of dh dpi, but our pi dot is minus dh dqi, minus dh dqi, and you can see these two sums cancel term-wise plus sign here and the minus sign here. But what's left is the partial h with respect to time explicitly. So what that tells us is we know h is the energy, and these two are now gone. The time derivative of the energy is equal, equal to the explicit time derivative of the Hamiltonian. That means 
that if h is not explicitly a function of time, that's what I mean when I write it that way, then h is conserved. So that's the same conservation of energy criterion we had with the Lagrangian. Okay. Same as with L not being explicitly a function of time. Remember we said if L is not explicitly a function of time, then the energy is conserved. Um, and now we find that if H is not explicitly a function of time, then energy is conserved as well. Good, that's my shorthand for it. You guys may want to write some words in there as well, but it's an important result. Um, good, so now I'm going to ask you guys to set up a couple of Hamiltonians. Okay, good. So next we'll call this constructing the Hamiltonian. And what we start with, this is just the recipe we're going to run through. So we begin with a mechanical system and we have to, this is the same as Lagrangian mechanics of course, because we have to get to Lagrangian first, we can't just have a Hamiltonian. So you begin with a mechanical system, you find a set of generalized coordinates and their derivatives and then you express Lagrangian generally T minus U. But you know, we've already seen one that didn't have that simple form. I'm just going to keep it general. Lagrangian is a function of your coordinates, your velocities, and time. So that's the first thing. That itself can be a lot of work. So the next thing then is you define your momenta as dl qi dot, so that's what their definition is, and if we look at what I'm just going to call the proto-Hamiltonian, we have sum over e sub i q sub i dot minus l q t and t. So here we are not done. Okay. And this h must be expressed only in terms of q and t. In terms of q t and t. That means you have to eliminate Oh, my mistake here. This was Q dot. You have to eliminate all Q dots in here so there aren't any left whatsoever. So express in terms of Q, P, and T so that H is equal to H, Q, P, and T. So you have to arrive at this and having obtained this, then you have 
point three, you have your canonical equation. Now, u sub i dot is dh p sub i. u sub i dot is minus dh u sub i. Those are your differential equations. You have to solve them by hook or by crook. And then part four, your solution is q of t, t of t. You know, we could think of that as a 2n dimensional column vector one. And just by its construction, I'll put an important note here. If q of t is the solution to Lagrange's equations, the Euler-Lagrange equations, is so if q of t is the solution of the Euler-Lagrange equations, then this here is going to be the solution of the Hamiltonian equations, and vice versa. If Q, T, if Q and T solve Hamilton's equations, then Q of T is going to be a solution to the oil drawn equations. I wonder if I could write that a little different. Um, so this is by our construction. Let's see here. You know, we could say Q of T solves the euler lagrange equations. So it's equivalent to um, Q of T, P of T solves, or is a solution to Hamilton's equations. Okay. Okay. So yeah, there's an equivalence there. And uh, it's by construction. Okay. So good. So that's the, that's the process. We have to go through all of this construction of the Lagrangian analysis of the system. Um, that could you know, involve finding the good coordinates. And then you get to this object here, and then you can solve your system in this way. OK, so I'm going to give one more example, and I'll assign it to you. And then we'll see where some difficulties can arise in this construction of the Hamiltonian. the central force problem. We've just done the central force problem, so that's good. So central force, and we already know the Lagrangian is one half m r dot squared plus r squared t dot squared minus u of r. So we want to construct the Hamiltonian. So the first thing, so this is part one here. Now, under two, I would have to say that P sub R is DL T R dot. P sub B is DL T dot. Okay. And H. Now, we've done this before to get the energy so we can Note that H is going to be, for that class of, of uh, Lagrangian, it's just T plus U. The energy is just T plus U. So it's 1 half M R dot squared plus R squared T dot squared plus U of R. Okay. Not yet the Hamiltonian. Let me put it in scare quotes. Not yet the Hamiltonian, but we're going to express it terms of P. Um, so it actually let me go ahead and 
complete this step right here. So DLDR dot was M R dot. DLDP dot was M R squared P dot. Okay. And yeah, this was the linear momentum and this was an angular momentum as we recall. So now for my step three, I have H, and I can just make these substitutions. So I have MR dot squared over 2, so I'm going to end up with PR squared over 2M when I make that substitution. Right here I have MR squared P dot squared over 2, and I'm going to substitute with my piece of P. I fill these in here as well. So my P dot is P sub P over MR squared. I'm going to end up with P sub P squared over 2 M R squared. And I'm going to have U of R. Now this is looking pretty familiar because you're seeing, oh, that's, that's our L squared over 2 M R squared from the good old central force problem of effective potential, and sure it is. What we did was, you know, in effectively go into the Hamiltonian in the case of the central force problem. We, we constructed the energy and we found we were left with a, with a first order differential equation. The reason is, is that this piece of P is, con is constant as before. I haven't I haven't discussed cyclic coordinates yet, but it's going to be the same way. It's going to be the same way here in Hamiltonian mechanics. So good, there's our Hamiltonian. And for the homework, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. I'm not going to write out the equations of motion explicitly. I'll just remind us what we would then have. We will have... Um, P dot is dH d piece of P um, yeah and R dot is dH d piece of R and piece of P dot is minus dH R dot is minus D H D R. Okay. So you just write the canonical equation down. There's two sets of two. Four. Notice this one here. H is not explicitly a function of P. And therefore, P sub P dot equals zero. Therefore, P sub P. Right? This is zero. P sub P equals constant, and that's what we were calling the angular momentum before. Okay, nothing new there. But yeah, we would have these four equations. Um, and if you were solving this system with Hamilton's equations, you would actually end up doing exactly what we did with the Lagrangian. Because we have the constant there, you'd have your P sub R squared, and then um, yeah, you'd, you'd be able to make the substitution. This would be your effective potential, and you'd work your way through here. Okay. So, again, we don't see what we've gained here yet, but we will. Right now, we're just working our way through the formulas. And for the homework, I'm just going to say construct H for a point particle. Point particle with a potential energy in cylindrical coordinates and in spherical polar coordinates. And in spherical polar coordinates. You know, 
with the cylindrical coordinates is just one step away now, and with the spherical polar coordinates, you have to do a little more work. Um, you, have to, you have to do the Lagrangian first. So yeah, go ahead and construct those Hamiltonians. These are all easy because the, the substitution um, is so direct here. But it's possible for these, it's possible for the Q dots um, and the P's to be more mixed, more thoroughly mixed, and then you can't do this trivial diagonal type of substitution. And uh, that'll be our next topic. Let's see once again how the time is flowing. Yeah. So I think we'll launch that topic. still talking about constructing Hamiltonian, Hamiltonians and the point is going to be that it's not always as simple as what I've done here so we'll get a little more general The substitution that I did in these two cases, the one before and then this one, they were really direct and trivial and they will be the same right here. So let's look at a slightly more general case. Suppose h is equal to one half. I'm going to introduce some vector notation. Um, okay, not so fast. L equals L of Q, Q dot, and T having the form, having the form L equals one half, now what am I going to call my matrix? Ah yes, one half, I'm going to write it this way, T, Q dot, and dotted into q dot plus a of q a dot q a dot q plus a remnant here l naught of q and t so what we're looking at is a more general type of Lagrangian. Think of this as, a, as an n by n matrix. So T is an n by n matrix. And it is a function of the coordinates. T is an n by n matrix function of the coordinates. In fact, in the past, we've been calling it AIJ of Q, okay? So this, this would actually be our double sum. I'm going to use this vector notation. This here A is equal to A of Q. So up to the different notation, 
This is an, exa an example of this would have been our electromagnetic Lagrangian, particle, charge particle in an electromagnetic field, had this form, right? We had vector potential times V, so this is supposed to be Q dot, is it Q dot in my notes? Yeah, it is, supposed to be Q dot. And then we have some remnant part as a function of Q and T. We didn't actually have an explicit time dependent one, but we, we have that now. So N by N matrix, i.e. kinetic energy equals one half double sum Tij Qi dot Qj dot. That's what that's one way to represent this because it's a it's a, uh, a row times a column dotted into a column. Okay. So it's a matrix multiplication scalar product. I just want this compact form. Is equivalent to this right here. Now here's the thing. The ones that I've done fall under this rubric as well, except that our matrix has been diagonal in each case. Yeah. And the difficulty comes in if the matrix is not diagonal. Then you just don't have these clear substitutions, simple substitutions. Um, and the, the example we did when we had a Lagrangian for the charged particle was of this form where this was diagonal, but then we had that vector potential as well. So let's go ahead and right here, an example was our Lagrangian of the charged particle. electromagnetic field. Okay. So we did that one. In fact, we're going to take that one and construct this Hamiltonian because it's a perfect example. But the other note here is that the difficulty comes in if T is non-diagonal. Okay. Tij is not diagonal. then construction of H is non-trivial. Okay. Constructing Hamiltonian is non-trivial. But interesting, we get a little linear algebra um, out of this. So I think I'm going to do this now because, yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, so consult your notes again for the electromagnetic Lagrangian as an example of this. But we can construct the Hamiltonian, so to speak, in one fell swoop. Okay, so to get the Hamiltonian now, what we have to do is define, define momentum, generalized momentum as B L B Q dot, right? In the vector notation, that's just all n of those derivatives, like a big gradient. And what do we have here? We have um, T times, if, so from the first one, we're just going to have T times Q dot. And from the second one, we're going to have the vector A. Remember, A is a function of Q, T is also a function of Q, so the derivative of Q dot went right through there. So Q dot plus A. And what that implies is that Q dot is equal to the inverse matrix times P minus A, right? Subtract off A, so take P minus A equals P Q dot, and you multiply the inverse matrix on both sides. 
and you isolate Q dot. Okay, so that's really nice, but of course, in reality, that requires some doing. If it's a diagonal matrix, then the inverse is also diagonal and it's trivial. Okay. But if it's a non-diagonal matrix, you got your work cut out for you. Nonetheless, let's see what we have now. So now H equals, um, in fact, we don't need the summation. We have DL dQ dot dotted dot minus L, that's the generic dot product of the vectors that replace the sum. And we have for the DL dQ dot, we have PQ dot plus A dotted into Q dot. And we're going to subtract off the L so we have minus a half p q dot q dot minus a a dotted into q dot minus l zero yeah that's just nomenclature I'm tempted to put a minus sign up here and a plus sign down here but You know, we'll put the minus sign here because generally this is just a potential term, right? Potential energy, that's the remnant of the L there. So let's go ahead and put the minus sign there and then we can put the plus sign here. And now we just have to simplify. We have T Q dot dotted into Q dot plus A. In fact, I don't even have to write these out. Um, let's just point at them first and then write them out. So we're going to have T Q dot dotted into Q dot minus dot. Missing? Minus this one half of it. Okay. We're going to have I missed here. Minus a q oh. So far so good. T q dot q dot dot q dot minus the entire L. So minus a half of the same, so we are now at one half t q dot dotted into q dot plus this L zero of q and t. So here's our proto-Hamiltonian, but we're not done yet. This has the same problem as before. We have to replace the Q dots, okay. but we can do that here. We end up with H equals one half T, that's the matrix. Now the Q dot is T inverse T minus A. And we're going to dot that into Q dot again, which is T inverse T minus A. And then we're going to have a plus L zero. And here, we 
we have the t times the t inverse, which is just unit. So that cancels, turns into the unit matrix. Then we got a p minus a dotted in the t inverse p minus a plus l naught. So here's our result. We'll have everything up here now. We'll erase this. So that's going to turn into a 1. This p minus a dot I can put back in the same form I had before. So 1 half, we've got the t inverse applied to p minus a. And I can dot that into p minus a. Because the dot product is commutative. Okay, so there's no problem there. Plus L0. But you're going to see, we're going to do an example where this P minus A plays a big role, namely the electromagnetic magnetic one. In the diagonal type of case, and in the simplest case, this just turns into 1 over 2M, right? This T inverse, if you had a mass there, it'd be 1 over, 1 over the mass. Okay. But in the general case, it's an inverse matrix. So yeah, if you have a non-diagonal to re to repeat this all, if you have a non-diagonal matrix in your kinetic energy, and you know we have those with our small oscillations, for example. We've got a non-diagonal matrix. We did a couple of those. That would be a case where the Hamiltonian would require this inversion, this inverse matrix. And we're going to see this will represent the vector potential that Hamiltonian that we want to do with this, I'll put that up there next time, um, is our electromagnetic one. That's an important one. So I think we'll leave it right here um, and pick up next time where we're leaving off. Let's see. Okay, good. See you guys next time.